Welcome to Prison, The Hidden Sentence, raising awareness and providing education and insights for individuals and families with incarcerated loved ones, educating and empowering through personal stories of those affected by and involved with our prison population. This is Julia with Prison, The Hidden Sentence, and today I'm here with Bill Baroni, who has had many positions in government. He's currently a partner and advisor to Duchess Management, a professor at Seton Hall University Law School, a member of the Board of Interrogating Justice, board member of the National Corral, co-founder of the Prison Visitation Fund, and a leader in the area of health and fighting obesity. We're going to learn more about his journey through wrongfully being convicted of a conspiracy that brought him to where he is today. This podcast is filled with so much information that we aren't going to be able to provide Bill's full journey. So to learn more about Bill, you can also go to the podcast on prison, thehiddensentence.com forward slash podcast. Bill and I met through the Prison Visitation Fund organization. It's a wonderful organization that's helping families stay connected. Sometimes a loved one may be incarcerated far away from the family and it may be a financial burden for the family to visit. Prison Visitation Fund provides a way for families to visit and stay connected. And we'll learn more about it from Bill later in the podcast. So first of all, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Julia, thanks for having me. I'm just so looking forward to speaking with you. So let's start with your backstory and why you're interested in helping families with incarcerated loved ones. And then we'll go into what you're doing to help families with incarcerated loved ones. Again, thanks for having me. You know, my journey in the criminal justice system essentially began in 2015, I guess, when the United States Attorney for New Jersey indicted me and a woman named Bridget Kelly for what he accused us as breaking nine federal laws involving the Bridgegate case, which was the realignment of lanes on the George Washington Bridge. And it was a major political scandal. And Bridget and I were the only two people prosecuted, and we were prosecuted, we were convicted, we appealed, we were convicted in November of 2016, and then in November of 2018, the Court of Appeals threw out half of our conviction and kept half the conviction. And at that point, I had to make a tough decision. You know, I have older parents. They are now almost 80 at the time they were in their mid-70s, and I'm going to be one of their caregivers. And I had to decide... Did I want to keep the appeal going to the Supreme Court? Did I want to go in and start serving my 18-month prison sentence? And I decided to do both, that I would start serving because the biggest thing for me is what would happen if something, and I waited another six months or a year waiting on the Supreme Court to decide whether they'd even take the case. And something happened to my dad and stepmom. So I remember sitting at the Outback Steakhouse in Hamilton, New Jersey that night and talking to dad in June, and I decided to go in and start serving my sentence at the same time keeping my appeal to the Supreme Court going. But the odds of the Supreme Court taking any particular case are one in 10,000, even worse if you're a criminal defendant like I was. So I began serving on April 9th, 2019. I walked into Loretto Federal Prison in Western Pennsylvania, and I began serving what I thought would be an 18-month prison sentence. To my and probably everybody else's surprise, three months later, the United States Supreme Court did grant that they were going to hear our case and ordered, I was ordered released a couple of days later. And then in 2020, right before the start of the COVID pandemic, we were one of the last cases heard by the Supreme Court in person. And a few months after that, the Supreme Court said that we were wrongly convicted. But in that three months that I did spend in prison, it really gave me an education and insight that I never had before. And all my time in serving in government, I was elected to the legislature, uh, both the New Jersey General Assembly and the New Jersey State Senate ran the Port Authority, the largest transportation agency in the country, overseeing bridges and tunnels and rail and the port and the World Trade Center, buses. But nothing educated me as much in the area of criminal justice as this three months that I spent in Loretto Federal Prison, surrounded by some of the most important people that I ever got to know in my life. And that has brought me to chatting with you, but it's also brought me to advocacy on behalf of people who are about to go into prison, who are in prison, who have now come out of prison. You know, one third, as you know, and your listeners surely know, one third of the people in the United States either are, are a close family member of, or have a friend who is in the criminal justice incarceration system. One third, that's a hundred something million people. And one of the things that I really believe is that I've been given the opportunity because when the Supreme Court ruled in our favor, I was able to get my law licenses back. 
I started teaching law. I had taught law for 15 years before Bridgegate, and now I'm teaching law again. I have a great group of students who are studying prison law, a course that I wrote, that are going to go out there, whether they be defense attorneys or prosecutors or people in the nonprofit sector or judges or clerks, teaching them and learning from them about the law with people who are incarcerated and something comes up every day. And I'm just really grateful to be here to be able to continue the mission that you and I both share and a lot of your listeners share, which is how do we help people who are in this incarceration system? Well, I really appreciate you sharing your story because it takes being involved with the system to really understand how it affects everyone. And especially we focus on the families on the outside or the whole prison family. I mean, it's so important to keep the family on the outside and the person that's incarcerated together because it's still a family member. There's still love in that family. And whether the person is guilty or not, we don't know. A lot of times there's a lot of people that are incarcerated that are innocent, we're learning. But for you to be able to have experienced it, I know it must've been a horrible experience. However, to have that insight of both being on the outside in the law and the legislature, working with so many people on the outside and never having been exposed to it, and then meeting people inside that you said were some of the most wonderful people that you've met, that gives insight to people, especially people that haven't been affected that are listening, that people are people and there's good people everywhere. Just because somebody's incarcerated doesn't mean that they're a horrible person. Oh, absolutely, absolutely correct. And you know, I really believe that to be true. Yeah. And, you know, it can happen to anybody. So that's something that I really want to bring awareness to is that it can happen to anybody. And these podcasts are to raise awareness and also to help people get through different things. And because of what you've been through, you're actually giving back. You're being an advocate and you're giving back. So let's talk about what you're doing to give back. Well, I think to, to go back to the point you just made about families on the outside and people who are on the inside, I actually think, and first of all, I think there's a lot of data that supports this, that when people go into the incarceration system, they're in prison, their families are on the outside. Keeping people in touch with their families as much as possible actually benefits three different groups. First, I think it benefits the person who's incarcerated, knowing that your family is out there, knowing that you're, you know, 90 something percent of the people are going to go home at some point, keeping that close tie. Maybe it's keeping close to your kids or your spouse, your partner. It's also good. Second, it's also good for the family on the outside, right? You know, so many families, their idea of prison is, you know, some movie or something they've seen on television and they're worried sick about their husband or their wife or their kid who's blocked up behind bars. The third group I think it benefits is everybody who's not a person in prison or their family. Because when someone comes home, and again, the vast, vast majority of people who are incarcerated are going to come home. When somebody comes home, the data is clear that the closer relationships they've had with their family while they've been incarcerated, the better chance they have of economic success, getting a job, rebuilding their life, and not committing crime again, not being a recidivist. And that benefits all of us. So the idea that some people have that, you know, we should have you know, people separated from their families is crazy. It's crazy. It's bad for the person who's incarcerated. It's bad and wrong for the families, but it's also just bad public policy. And now having been on all sides of the public policy issue, both as a policymaker and then someone who was incarcerated, and you really learn that we need to do something, we need to do a lot to keep people together with their families. And that has meant a variety of things. I think Congress has taken some positive steps. And this was a, one of the few bipartisan things that came out of the President Trump's administration, where both Democrats in Congress and President Trump and his administration passed the First Step Act, which has a lot of flaws and needs a lot of fixing. We could do many podcasts on that. But one of the things that was important is it told the Bureau of Prisons to try and keep people closer to home, right? And especially in the federal system or in large states like California or Texas, where you could be sending a loved one six, seven, eight hours away from their home. And I just believe we need to do everything we can to build a system where people are kept as close to home as safely reasonable. And so that's one of the things along as another as a great organization I'm involved with called Interrogating Justice that does some wonderful work in this space. And does a, It's a really terrific group of people. 
And obviously, I, along with my dear friend and, and colleague, Gordon Kaplan, who also lived the criminal justice system, we founded the Prison Visitation Fund to help families and help people who are incarcerated stay together and in touch with each other. I think staying in touch is so many ver a variety of ways, right? The most common we think of is visits, telephone, the email system, the state or federal core links email system, and writing letters. And everything as policymakers that we should be doing is to encourage that communication. So when I hear stories that as an, a measure of discipline in a prison, that the phones and the email are turned off. In fact, I heard a story, actually the, the, one of the places I heard from, that something happened, disciplinary infraction took place, and the decision was to turn the phones and emails off for three or four weeks, including over Valentine's Day. What terror, first of all, it's just a cruel thing to do, but it's also terrible public policy, right? There are other, look, discipline infractions are going to happen in a prison setting. I understand that. Lived it when I was away, but that's just bad public policy. We're saying, we're going to just not let you talk to your loved ones. So not only does that prevent you from talking to your loved ones, it prevents that your loved ones from hearing from you and making sure you're okay. When we charge an extraordinary amount of money for paper, excuse me, or envelopes, that's a terrible public policy. When we make it as hard as possible for people to visit, that's terrible public policy. So not only is it morally right to have people be able to spend more time with their families, even when they are incarcerated, it's also good public policy to have people spend more time with their family. And so your organization is doing so much great work when it comes to keeping families together. You know, it's interesting, you know, when you get convicted and you do the federal system, they call it the PSR. Every state's got a little bit different of a system, but basically a series of interviews that you do with probation officer who then reports to the judge about recommendation for sentence and your background and your life. They also interview your family. They also put your family in the PSR. And that list in the PSR becomes your visitation, your initial visit, essentially your initial visitation list. So they do all this work before you go in to highlight your family and community ties. And when you get there, they want to cut them off. And that's just dumb. You know, not is it morally wrong. It's just, just dumb. It's bad public policy. We want people to come out of prison. You know, we say, we send people to prison. We've said, you know, one of the things I talked to my great students at Seton Hall Law School about was the concept of the history of incarceration. And there was a period of time for a long time in the history of incarceration, both in this country and other, and other parts of the world, where the idea of incarceration is you put someone where they can't speak to anyone and they never see people from the outside world other than maybe a person from a, a chaplain or something. That was the concept for a long, long time. And we realized that that is a terrible concept to cut people off from the outside world and not have those links. Today, it's even worse. But yet we continue to have these legacy issues of making it difficult for people to visit or inmates to write and call. And so one of the things I try and do is in everything I can, including staying in touch with people who are incarcerated, staying in touch with people who have gotten out and staying in touch with their families. It's one of the things I think we're all committed to. I couldn't have said it better myself. Everything that you said, you said it so eloquently and so truthful. And I really appreciate that because there's so many things that people don't understand about the system. We'll talk about the prison visitation fund in a little bit. But I wanted to go back to a lot of things that you were saying about the system on the outside. And do you have any suggestions for family members or just for people that are listening on what we can do to help the system or to advocate? Sure. I think there's a couple of answers to that. One, we'll start sort of in the, the biggest sense, in the sense of the public policy thing that I talked about. If you break the numbers down that we talked about, and let's let's just, just use the number that is one third of the people in the country have a loved one who is, or for themselves, a loved one or a family member or a close friend who's been incarcerated. It's, it's about one third. It's about, let's say it's a hundred million people. Well, I, I want to say too, that it also affects people that are totally in the system, whether they're in jail, whether they're in a prison, whether they're on parole or probation. I mean, that all affects the family too. So I wanted to throw all of them into that too. Right. So you, you put all that number, let's say it's about a hundred million people. That is more than any presidential candidate in the history of the country votes they've ever gotten, ever, right? They are people in every congressional district. There are people in every legislative district all over the country that are truly touched by personally having a loved one or them themselves in the prison system. One of the things to be able to, to do, and I, I wish this had happened when I was in the legislature, is to reach out to your members of Congress and the members of your state legislature and talk about what's happening in the prison system. People often don't know. They often don't know. Legislators and Congress people don't know what's happening in prisons in their own district. 
And I can tell you, nothing gets responded to more, I think, in the prison system than a call, a letter, or a visit from a member of Congress or the legislature. And There's two things there I just wanted to address that a lot of family members are afraid to talk about it. They're afraid that it's going to affect their loved one is one. And number two is people that live in a different state. We have families that have a loved one that's in a different state, so it's not their legislature, so they really don't know who to go to. It is a concern. I mean, it's, it's always a worry that if Bill Baroni Sr. calls a congressman and says, you know, my son is at Loretto Prison and this has just happened, you worry what's going to happen to Bill Baroni Jr. I think what it does is it causes us to have to really focus on continuing to be involved when our loved one gets out and continue to advocate on people who are on the inside, which is one of the things you're doing, one of the things that I'm doing. But it is a real concern. I think also being involved in organizations like yours that are in yours, interrogating justice and others that allow when you say it and your organization says it, it gets to take away a little bit of that sting, right? So if you're advocating on Bill Baroni's behalf, who's in Loretto prison, like it doesn't come back to blame me because they don't know that I'm the person that you're trying to advocate for. So for example, I heard a, a recently, I had a very specific conversation with someone who was incarcerated, a loved one of someone who was incarcerated, that they had just stopped doing the RDAP program. No explanation. What is that, the RDAP program? Well, the federal system, a lot of states have as well. RDAP is the Residential Drug and Alcohol Program, and it's a terrific program. It's, enough, it's an example of getting people home quicker and also helping people battle the, the battle addiction. It can do a program of people back to their homes and their communities earlier than their sentence. It actually gives a sentence reduction. And I was able to advocate on their behalf without saying who I was advocating for. And so this for the person is not going to be targeted. And that's a real concern. And also, I just want to think another thing that families can do is continue to stay in touch. I know a lot, some families are very active because of life happening and economic challenges, feel that they're lost, feel that they're not being supported. And that's the time more than ever to reach out to those folks. So if you know of a family, one of the things that I just the other day is a, a case in my hometown, a young person going to be going away for a bit. And I reached out to his family and I know that my dad does that. And so it's important that when you hear of another family going through what we've been through and our families have been through, reach out. I mean, I remember when I was going through Bridgegate and going through my case, I, first of all, 90 something percent of the people in my life disappeared. I think for a lot of people and a lot of families, when they have a loved one go through this, a significant number of their friends, I put it in quotation marks, and their neighbors and people in their life and maybe even other relatives just disappear. So like they, true. Have, they have some dread disease, right? Your next door neighbors got jammed up in something, or we, but we don't want to touch, we don't want to talk to them. Or your cousin's son got jammed up in something and, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to be seen with that person. What a terrible thing to do. And I lived it. I mean, 90 something percent, maybe more of the people in my life disappeared, just gone. And that not only just hurts as a person, but it makes the loneliness start even earlier. You know, my friend Jeff Grant, who runs a great white group called the White Collar Support Group, says that the loneliness is part of it. Like you're, you know, you're used to going about your life and then you get prosecuted. And then, you know, as you mentioned before, there's a great book called uh, Three Felonies a Day, that the average American commits three felonies a day, not knowing it, right? And some people get prosecuted and some people don't. And reach out. I mean, I, I didn't need people to fix my problems. I didn't think there was a magic wand somebody could wave, make it go away. But boy, it'd be nice to hear from people, not just as someone who was the defendant or person being prosecuted, but also my family. Now, I was lucky. My dad and stepmom had a great support network in my hometown. My hometown, where I was elected to the legislature, was very supportive of them, very supportive of me. But, you know, that made it easier for me to go away, knowing that people were looking after my dad and stepmom, but there's another thing that families who can do is look out for each other. So when you see someone going through this, reaching out to them and being a support network for them matters. And if you're somebody whose next door neighbor's kid gets jammed up in something, realize their whole life has been turned upside down. Everything they thought about their life is no longer. I mean, I sat there every day in a federal courtroom in Newark, New Jersey, day in and day out for six or seven weeks. And my father and stepmother sat behind me every day. They were there when the foreman of the jury stood up and said guilty nine times. They were there when the judge gave me an initial sentence of 24 months and then another sentence of 18 months when they had to resentence me. They watched their son stand there as the judge read the verdict. They watched 
that morning of April 9th at 3.30 in the morning when I walked out of their house. I stayed in their house the night before I went to prison. They watched me walk down the front lawn of my house that I grew up in and get into my dear friend John Holub's car. And John drove me the four hours to prison. Your family lives it with you. But, you know, when you go in, at least I knew I was okay. There's dad and June at home. They didn't know that. And so reach out to people who are going through it. Support organizations like yours and others who are helping family members because it can be darn lonely. And we've all heard those stories. We've all heard those stories of people whose loved ones are just gone. Maybe it's becoming an economic crisis. Maybe it's becoming a uh, lose their homes. The one thing the family you can do is help families who are going through the, the prosecution system. Then when their loved one goes away, people, when I was in Loretto, looked at me at 18, what I thought was 18 months, and they're like, you're a short timer. There were people in there who had 10 years, people in there who had been in longer than 10 years. My dear friend, uh, Bear, the next bunk over, had been for 30 years, 30 years. You know, it goes to the point about those people who are in prison whose family members pass away. And for no reason, the prison system denies them the ability to go to the funeral. Now, there's always going to be people who's, a flight risk or a security risk, or they're very violent and you wouldn't want that person being allowed to go to somebody's funeral. But think of a system where we don't let people go to their, I mean, people lose children. We don't let them go to their kid's funeral, right? We need a system that is more flexible to life. And it's not just because it's the right moral thing to do, which it is. It's the right thing to do as a people, knowing that the person inside Loretto or Montgomery or Fort Dix or anywhere else is coming home, right? That person is coming back to the community. They're going to come back to the neighborhood they were from. They're going to come back to their hometown. And do we want Bill or Julia or Mary or Bob or anybody coming back to a community that stayed in touch with their family or not? The answer is, of course we do. And part of that is families utilizing organizations like yours and others that will advocate on their behalf. And some of that advocacy sometimes works, like the reduction in the amount of distance that the Bureau of Prisons should send an inmate. Part of it is advocating for organizations like yours, advocating for better and more flexible visiting hours. Part of it is, is advocating for what I believe is the next step in technology in the prison system. For those of you who are listening to this podcast right now, you don't realize that Julie and I are actually looking at each other. Now, we're not in the same place. We are three time zones apart as we record this, but we're looking at each other. And through Zoom, we need to build a technology in the prison systems at both the state and that there's some small amounts of this around the country, but we need to build this in the federal and other systems to allow people who are incarcerated to utilize technology that is now not cutting edge, like Zoom and others, to see each other. Imagine a world where, as opposed to my 15-minute call on the prison phone system, which I did every night to my dad, if we had the chance for five or 10 minutes to do a Zoom with each other, and we had to see each other, and dad would realize that I was doing okay, and I could see him. This is not a security risk. This is not a flight risk. This is not a risk of contraband coming into a prison, which is always the answer about why we don't do things. I think a very reasonable thing for the Bureau of Prisons to, to investigate and a very reasonable thing for Congress to consider funding and the use of the outside world. We've got many, many great organizations out there who raise lots of money in the criminal justice space. You want to do something that's going to help people stay in touch, advocate for and help fund a system. Look, I understand we don't want to have Bureau of Prisons don't, doesn't want to have, I shouldn't say we, Bureau of Prisons doesn't want to have people who are on the internet. You're never going to change that view. But you can technologically build a system. The people who created Zoom and people who created, people who work for Apple and Microsoft, you know, there's some 12-year-old somewhere who's a genius who could figure this out in four minutes about how you could build a computer system, just the same way you did with CoreLinks, build a computer system that would allow me to see my dad, to see you, Julia, to see people who you care about on the Zoom. We can do that. This is not rocket science. We should do that. That's another thing that we could be doing to help families stay in touch with each other, because especially during COVID, when you know you had prisons that were closed for a year and a half, this is smart. This is using technology that is a safe, non-risk to the order of the prison. And look, you can always have limitations on it and things, but for goodness sakes, let's get the Bureau of Prisons who's working hard. They face unbelievable challenges. I get that. We have a new director of the Bureau of Prisons. She's come out of the Pacific Northwest. Let's use technology to keep families closer together. And this is another way to do it. There's so many things I want to touch on that you said, or just talking about communication. I think one of the things that they push back on is funding. Where are they getting the money for it? 
taxpayers don't want to pay for that because there's so many other things that are needed. So that's where I see a lot of the pushback. However, if there's organizations out there like Zoom, Microsoft, and other companies, Apple, just so many out there that would be willing to support something, to support a pilot or do something like that. So if anybody out there has any contacts, let us know. I think that would be something really good because during the pandemic, you mentioned the pandemic, and that was so horrible for families and so horrible for people that were incarcerated. People don't realize that people that were incarcerated were locked up for maybe 23 hours of the day and just getting out for an hour if they could. I would put it in, I mean, it was just the conditions were really horrible for everybody. And we're not totally through it yet. I mean, things are a little better. Visitation has opened up, but some places only allow visitation for two hours. So you have people that, want to travel, they might have to go four, five, six, nine hours to see their loved one, I'm talking about here in Nevada, for two hours. So do they load up the kids and the dog and they go down there, they visit their loved one and then come home? And I'm saying there was somebody that did that for those two hours. And I know when my brother was incarcerated, I could visit for the whole weekend. I had to travel. When you were talking about that day in the court when they announced the guilty verdict, I mean, it brought tears to my eyes, and I think other people have been through that because I was right back there on that day when that happened, when they took him away. I mean, and when somebody is taken into the system, they, you can't say goodbye to them. It's just like they're gone, and the family's standing there in shock. And one of the things that I would like to see is some kind of support for the families, their support for victims as there should be. However, I'd also like to see some kind of support for the family so that they know what to expect because they have to wait for their loved one to be processed so they might not hear from them for weeks or even months. Yeah. And they don't know what's going on. So groups like Prison Families Alliance, which is the nonprofit that I'm involved with that does peer support groups, you're saying there's so much that we do to help the families, but to let everybody know, because like we said earlier, it can happen to anybody. Don't think that it's not going to happen to you or somebody that you know. And then also going back to what you said about families being ostracized, that there's a stigma that, you know, there's families with children and all of a sudden their children can't play with other children because their parents won't let them. And the kids are like, what happened? And it causes so much trauma for the family. And you just touched on so much that anybody that's been through it can totally relate to, agree with you, and people that haven't been through it, students or other people that are listening, they're aware of what's happening out there and what we can do. There's, there's yeah, just so much. absolutely right. There's so much out there, and it's a real need to support. And I keep coming back to this, is that people are going to be coming back to the neighborhood. They're coming back to the community and in almost all cases. And isn't it better to have that support network there? And it's also just the right thing to do. It just is. No, I agree. And Prison, the Hidden Sentence has workshops. So one of the programs is a reentry program for families. And what I would love to see is a wraparound program that the person, the loved one that's incarcerated, along with the family is going through this program so that they can communicate, so they can stay in touch, that they can be a part of the family. And then when they get out, they have have they have a plan. They've been communicating and they've set boundaries, but they're on an agreement. So again, they have a better chance of being successful in society. Because the other thing that happens, which I know you're well aware of, when people come out, do they have to check the box when they go for a job? Yes, I've been incarcerated. And it's hard for them to find jobs. And the other thing that people don't realize, especially people that have been incarcerated for a long time, there's two things. One is they don't have credit. If they don't have family, how do they get a place to live? And also the technology changes. So having programs in the prison is really important, too, and I, I think you touched on that. And I want to talk about the Prison Visitation Fund, because I just think that's such a wonderful program. If you want to tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you for allowing me to talk about something. I care about this organization a lot. You know, when I was in Loretto, you know, I was very fortunate. I had visits pretty much every week. My dad and June, I'll tell you a story in a second, but my dad and June would come about once every three weeks, four weeks, I had friends come visit from Ireland, from New York, from Chicago to visit. 
But at the same time, there were other people that didn't get visits. Sadly, some people's families have passed away or they've been forgotten. But for some, it was they couldn't afford to go. And I remember one person that I got close to there and his family was from Baltimore and Baltimore is only a hundred something miles from Loretto. His family couldn't afford the bus or hotel to come visit for a Saturday or Sunday. And when I got out, and I began working with my friend Gordon Kaplan, who had also been in Loretto. We were not there at the same time. And we talked about one of the needs that we saw is families just could not afford to see their loved ones, sometimes for years. So we began a nonprofit. It's still in its early days, working with some terrific people. One of my colleagues, Makeda, who I work with, who has really become a terrific champion in this space. And she's really working so hard to connect families and keep families together. So what we do under Gordon and I and our and our team and Makeda, people have prisonvisitationfund.org. They can find our application process online. We're continuing to try and raise funds to pay for this and also pay for people to go and visit their loved one. Unfortunately, there's far more applications than there is funds to support it, but we're continuing to try to keep families together. One of the reasons I do it is you see when you're in prison, the days where you have visitation are so special, right? You just, there's a positive feeling on the compound, right? People are up and they're dressed in their uniforms on a Saturday or Sunday and they, their families are there and kids are running around the visitation room and there's a positive and it, it keeps your spirits up. Now imagine a world where your family wishes they could come and they can't afford it. That's not a system that I want to be a part of. So we're going to do something about it. And under Gordon's leadership and, and all of us, you know, we're really committed to try and help as many families and as many incarcerated people as we can. And we've had some real successes. And look, I learned very early on, I got to tell you a story. I learned very early on how important visitation is. I went in in April and I was there for about 10 days. And honestly, I was doing fine. I was surrounded by a, a very good group of people in Loretto. I was fine. I was not, didn't have anxiety. I was sleeping just fine. In fact, in some ways, the my first night of sleep in prison was one of the best nights of sleep I'd had in a long time, right? Because there's nothing more the government could do to me, right? They sent me to prison. I, I knew I'd be fine. But my dad in June, home in Hamilton, New Jersey, four hours away. And as you were mentioning before, I wasn't even able to talk to them for the first three or four days, maybe more. But anyway, so they were the first visitors I got. And so they drove on the Friday. The visitation was Saturday and Sunday at Loretto Camp from 8.30 to 2.30. So they drove over the Friday night before and stayed at the Courtyard by Marriott in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And so I talked to dad the night before and I said, look, Bob, make sure you get here at about 8.15. So when you go, you can get through security and then you and I can spend, we three of us can spend six hours together. I said, but Pop, if you're not here by 9.30, they shut the prison down for count. So if I'm with you in the visitation room, we can stay. But if not, they shut everything down. I got to go back to my bunk and you got to stay in the parking lot. And my father is a very prompt guy, former military guy, says to me, oh, no, we'll be there. We'll be on time. Don't worry. And oh, OK, we got these. said we printed out the directions. Like, OK, get up the next morning. My first visitation Sunday and you put on your green uniform, your black boots and you wait and they start calling people into the visitation room. Bear reported to the visitation room. Datillo worked reported to the visitation room. Boylan, no Baroni. It's now 8.45, no bill. It's now nine o'clock. And all of the anxiety and panic and upset that I had not had showed up. And I'm thinking there was an accident. Somebody's been taken to the hospital. Somebody got sick. They're lost in you know rural Western Pennsylvania. And I couldn't do anything about it. The very reason I went into prison when I did, even though my friend Bridget stayed out was to get it over with so I could be there for my father and stepmother. And now they are lost or they are hurt or they are killed in an accident. And it's all my fault because I did this. I went to prison and I was in full panic. 9.15, no dad. I am in full panic. 9.30, they call count. And I'm thinking the worst. And I go over to the phone on the way to the bunk to go for count for the 9.30 count. I pick the phone up and dial my dad's cell phone number, hoping, hoping, that something, maybe he'd answer. And sure enough, he answered the phone. I said, Pop, where are you? He said, we're in the parking lot. I said, what are you doing in the parking lot? He said, well, when we got here, they had just shut the prison down. We have to wait an hour. I said, yeah, I get that, Pop. I thought you guys were getting here at 8.30. He said, oh, well, yeah, when we came downstairs this morning to come over to the prison, you know, they have a breakfast buffet. I said, what? He said, oh, they have a breakfast buffet. And my father said what every 75-year-old person would say at this very moment. He said, it came with the room. <laughs> yeah. and then he and then he says to me he says well i knew you weren't going anywhere <laughs> yeah 
Oh my gosh. So you realize, and it's very, my father's uniquely able to keep me humble. You realize though how important, so dad comes into the visit, you know, 1030, whatever it was, he got in and we sat there and we visited and, and it was good for me. It was good for him. It was good for everybody there to, to have visits. And over the course of that time, you know, I was saying before, I had people just come, one of my closest friends would come every three weeks. I had an amazing friend who flew in from Ireland because they want to be there to support you. And they also want to know that you're okay. And every family member who's listening to this podcast, I get it. I understand. I saw it on my father's face that first time he visited, not the breakfast buffet part, but when he was sitting there in a visitation room. And I walked in, here's this tough guy, military guy, you know, been through a lot, watched his kid go to prison, lost another child. My sister passed away, tough guy. And I saw the pure panic on his face, sitting in a visitation room of a federal prison in Pennsylvania. It's not something he ever wanted to see for his son. Trust me, it's not something his son ever wanted to see for his father. But there I am in the, in the visitation room and my father started to realize that I was gonna be okay. You know, in the camp, they often will let people in higher level prisons that you can only talk to your visitor. But in the camps, it's a little bit less strict. And so, you know, dad would see the people I was there with were, were taking care of me. And that was good for him. Because, you know, when somebody gets sentenced to prison, they're not the only one sentenced. It's not just me that was going to prison. Dad and June were too. And Andy and Mike and all of my friend John and Johnny and, and Georgina and all these people and Maureen and all these people who came to visit, they were living it too. Living it too. You know, that's why I call it prison the hidden sentence, because it's a hidden sentence that people don't realize that people on the outside are serving. Right. You put that point up really well. That's exactly right. And therefore, as we make public policy and also how we support each other, it's important things like these podcasts that people should know they're not alone. No, they're not the only people going through this. It's important some of the seminars that you're doing and that others are doing to let family members know, not just as their family member is going in, but as a continuum while they are in. Look, it's one thing, I was 18 months, but what if you have 18 years? What do you do then? And how do we support them? That's not in any way to minimize the effect that whatever thing happened, that there are victims. We need to support our victims too. True. They are equally suffering, especially if the crime is, is a violent crime. No, I appreciate um, you bringing that up because we're not diminishing the crime for anything for victims. We're, we're focusing on what the family can do. No, and I think the reason that I say that, I was uh, having lived it, but you know, you look at any other Western country, any other Western country, their system of keeping incarcerated people closer to their families far exceeds anything this country does. And whether it's Ireland, where I spend a lot of time, or other parts of Europe or other parts of the West, we can improve the system. And yet people always say, well, it's expensive. It's expensive everywhere, right? And you can't have a system and say, well, why do people commit crimes again? Well, part of it is they don't get to stay in touch with their families while they're in. Part of it is, as you mentioned before, they get out and they have trouble getting a job. Maybe their employee was a group of pastors in Western Pennsylvania, actually, after I was out, went to a meeting. And there was a fellow there who had been incarcerated, I believe, in the state system in Pennsylvania and applied for a job at Wendy, which is a great place to work. And it's such a pr important People want, want the benefit of work and was turned down because he had been a felon. It wasn't like he was a felon, like stealing burgers at a, at a burger place. Like he was a, whatever he had done had nothing to do with Wendy's. They wouldn't hire him. Or you can't get a bank account. Every single person I know that has been incarcerated, me included, even to this day, trouble getting a bank account. And I was ruled nine nothing by the Supreme Court of the United States that I didn't do anything illegal. I have trouble with banking. You're my friend Ralph from the Bronx who serves 10 years on a drug charge, nonviolent drug charge, nothing to do with banking, not bank fraud, didn't rob a bank, has trouble getting bank. So then we say to somebody, well, you can't get a bank account. Well, how do you get an apartment? Or if you can get an apartment, maybe you pay cash, what you're having to do, and you can get a job, maybe if you're lucky, you get a job, then you're getting your paycheck and you're going to one of these predatory check cashing places, right? So you're having to work harder and harder because the system won't give you a bank account, right? Or that's not a system that works. So what do we do? We end up pushing a certain number of people back into the very life that caused them to go to be incarcerated in the first place. That's not a system that works. And that's not a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a liberal. That's not, it's just government should work. This isn't working. And one of the things that's not working 
is that we're not doing everything we can within the understanding of valuing security of our corrections officers who work in the prison, the security of the communities that surround our correctional institutions uh, from a safety perspective, valuing and lifting up the family members of victims in those situations. But what we don't want to do is build a system that says, okay, we're going to take Bill and we're going to put lock him away. We're not going to let him get a job when he gets out. We're not going to let him have a bank account when he gets out. And yet somehow we're shocked, shocked that Bill commits a crime again. That's a crazy system. And what I'm sensing, though, is and I see it in my own students. I mean, last year I taught this class with 20-something students. This semester I'm teaching with nearly 60. People are interested in this. They're interested in criminal justice reform. It is something that crosses party and ideological lines, it crosses geographic lines. I think maybe thanks to podcasts like this and organizations like yours and Prison Visitation Fund and Interrogating Justice and the White Collar Support Group, and lots of really great organizations, we're making progress. But boy, do we have a long way to go. Yeah, it's like eating an elephant, right? One bite at a time. That's what they say. I'm not sure what. They didn't serve elephant in Loretto. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. That- Everything you said really hit a chord with me, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I just think it's so helpful for people to hear this, and I so appreciate your time and sharing just this wealth of knowledge because you've lived it, you've been through it, you've seen both sides, you've seen all the sides of it, and that's so important, and it's so important for the families to hear this and for other people. And what I'd like to leave with is you've already answered The question I usually leave with is, what would you leave the families with? If there's one thing, one or two things that you can leave everybody with that's going through it, for the families that have somebody that's incarcerated, that they're missing their loved one, just anything that you can provide them with that can give them hope. Things are slowly getting better. We had some small victories with the First Step Act, not only when it comes to placement of, of incarcerated people closer to their homes in the federal system. Things are getting better in the BOP, I hope, at the very top. That's the Bureau of Prisons. Bureau of Prisons, the United States Bureau of Prisons. I think that more and more people are recognizing the real public policy need to improve the system of communication with their family members. The thing I would say to family members, there are nights when you're sitting in prison and all you can think about is the picture that's in your locker of your wife, of your husband, of your kids, of your parents, and that fence around a prison can seem really high. The barbed wire really sharp, the guard towers really guarded, guns drawn. The one thing that gets over the fence, I guess a lot of things get over the fence, but one thing that gets over the fence and through the gate as it's someone who's incarcerated is knowing that your family is out there and knowing in those lonely days when you're sitting there in prison, whether it's a cell in a penitentiary or a bunk in a camp, that your family is out there. And the family needs to know that when the phone rings from the prison, your five-minute conversation with them is priceless. That we as incarcerated people are desperate to hear their voices or read their handwriting on a card or a Corelink's email. So what that tells me is that For those of us who are on the outside, what we can do is to help lift those families up and be there for them, check on them, help them do visits. If you know your next door neighbor is going to visit their kid who's locked up in Loretto five hours away, offer to babysit, offer to make, you know, I was a wonderful friend of dad and June's, uh, my friend Sue, who during would bring dinner over. I know this this sounds like there's so many more important things in the criminal justice system, and there are. But again, Bill was coming home. Julia's coming home. Bob's coming home. Bear's coming home. We got to do everything we can to make sure that when they come home, they can succeed and get a job and get a house and get an apartment and get a bank account. Become, we all say we want to rehabilitate people. Well, rehabilitation's got to be more than just a phrase. It's got to be something that we all do. So I just want to say thank you, because this organization and what you're doing and connecting families to each other, 